Well, hello everybody, and welcome to our next part on our uh, Marantz 2500 restoration series. And uh, what we're going to focus on in this video is the tuner section and the oscilloscope section. So, if we get that far, we'll see what all we run into. Um, as it is right now, the tuner is actually working pretty well. Um, but, you know, being that this is a restoration and the owner wants this completely done uh, from top to bottom, we have to recap the tuner board. So, uh, first thing I'm going to do is kind of clean some of this stuff up a little bit. And, uh, you know, I get a lot of comments asking. <laughs> it's funny. It's kind of a balance. For the last three years, I've learned so much about doing videos on YouTube or just doing videos in general. Um, you know, I'm kind of used to, I have taught classes over the years, and I'm kind of used to standing in front, uh, you know, of the students and interacting with them one-on-one -on -one so that, you know, they can ask questions I can answer directly and, you know, kind of having the, <laughs> the whiteboard behind me and the overhead projector or whatever. And, uh, you know, I get a lot of comments and sometimes I'm torn as to how to do some of these videos because for some of the more advanced uh, viewers out there, some of you, um, really the main thing you're looking for is the information on a specific piece of equipment that I'm working on. And uh, because maybe it's something that you've not worked on before and you really know the routine of how to recap something or how to hook a meter up to something. And, uh, you know, so for you guys I kinda get the comments that say well you know don't waste all your time on these things I just want to know the the meat and potatoes of it and then for other people who are new to the hobby or who are just learning um, who really don't know the basics you know I get the why don't you show me you know the how you do this rather than talk about it or you know I want to actually see it um, one thing I will say for, for some of the newer uh, people to the hobby, I do try to show the actual process of doing just about everything that I talk about in my videos. So if you kind of go back through my videos, you'll usually find some somewhere where I'm actually doing that. And one of the things that I regret not having done over the last three years was better categorizing my videos for things like you know, if you watch this video, I demonstrate how to replace capacitors or how to desolder something or how to hook up this meter this way or whatever. Because quite often I do that. And uh, <laughs> now it's been three years and I have quite a few videos up and I can't remember what I did where. I don't really go back and watch my old videos. Um, and... You know, I get so busy with things, I tend to forget stuff. Um, if you have specific questions, try to email me. Uh, one day every two weeks, um, there's a day I try to sit down and dedicate time to answering emails. And I usually will spend several hours doing that. Um, so usually if you email me, uh, usually the longest it takes me to get back to you will be two weeks. Sometimes it can be a little more, but... Usually within two weeks you'll get back, back from me and hopefully I can help you. So I hope that helps out a little bit. Uh, I do try to look at comments when they come in. I don't always catch every single one of them. Uh, YouTube doesn't always inform me of all the comments. And if I don't physically go through them all and sort through them and read them, um, I may miss some of them. But, uh, you know, I do try to cover some things from comments uh, you know if it's a good question and something that might be helpful to you or whatever I'll try to answer it so uh, with in the spirit of that comment I'm going through and kind of just cleaning a few things before I start taking this apart you know I'm using a brush with the bristles cut short because they're a little more stiff when you cut them short like that and I just go through and you see how cruddy dirty this is down here and you can just go through and kind of rub it off with this and then take a little paper towel and it does a nice job of uh, just breaking down the, the grunge and cleaning it off. 
Same thing with like components. You can kind of clean them off. And that's how I do it. I just go through. Um, again, I know there's folks out there that'll take these off, these boards, and throw them into a ultrasonic cleaner. I've never been a proponent of that. Maybe it's just a little bit of fear on my part, but uh, I just don't don't like the idea. These capacitors, um, they're not really hermetically sealed. I mean, you can get ingress of liquids up alongside the leads. That's why they leak out the bottom. Um, what leaks out, you can leak in as well. Um, same thing with like transistors. Um, even though they're, they're, that, there's that epoxy, you know, the outside is made out of that plastic, you can get some ingress of, of humidity or liquid up where the leads come in and it will cause problems inside and cause the transistors to be noisy and so forth. So when you get those transistors that are kind of, they crackle and pop sometimes, um, that you can exacerbate that by doing that. At least that's my thought on it. The other thing is anything with a coil like this, I would never want that to ever get wet. Um, a lot of these have wax in them to, to seal them and so forth. And that ultrasonic bath will actually break that down. So to me, you either kind of clean it the hard way like this or just blow it off with some canned air or something. Um, brush it you know with a soft bristle brush another good thing to use hold on um, you can use brushes like this which these are actually uh, anti-static brushes so anytime you're working around like you know the CMOS type uh, chips and things like you know like the 74 LS series um, integrated circuits and so forth this is uh, anti-static is what these bristles are made of like these ones are really soft bristles these ones are more coarse bristle bristles for like you know kind of rubbing tarnish off of things and sometimes you can kind of use that to get in there and clean this stuff off um, again you know it doesn't really matter on some of these components um, I use a really soft bristle brush like this for things like resistors and capacitors getting in between because the soft bristles kind of get inside there and they don't really move anything around or scratch anything. Um, but that's what I do. Again, is this stuff necessary? Not really. Um, I do it because I know when I do a re restoration job on these, people expect it to look new just as well as perform like new so um you know this is something you that people want to keep for a very long time they want it to look nice and that's why i take the time to do that so um a little bit of, of that another question i get a lot of times from everybody and again skip ahead if you don't want all the comments here i'm just trying to chat a little bit as i do this but another question i get a lot um is will you fix my model so and so receiver or tape deck or tuner or you know ham radio whatever and the, and uh, you know the answer to that is I have very limited time as much as I love doing this kind of stuff um, you know I still you know I have a, a wife and kids and uh, relatives and family and friends and I own a full-time business, um, and I, I'm not just somebody who sits in an office. I actually still go out in the field and work with the employees and with the equipment and with the customers. So I spend a lot of time with that as well. And what little time I do have with this is the time that you guys get to see because um, I typically just do enough of this work to, to make the videos. And I try to do stuff that is interesting to me and maybe something different and interesting to you. So I usually don't do uh, the same machine over and over and over and over again. In some cases I do if there's something new and different that I can show on it. But I don't really have a lot of time to do this sort of stuff as much as I'd like to. Now as I get closer to retirement here and uh, you know when I do retire... 
I do intend to do more of this just because I enjoy it and I will take on more uh, products at one time but right now I just don't have the time so it doesn't mean that if you email me I absolutely will not take on the project but right now I'm kinda really booked <laughs> for a long time I'm booked and uh, so it might be a very long wait and there's no guarantee I'll be able to do it for you but uh, like I said it doesn't hurt to email me um, and again if I can if things work out I certainly hitting the camera here certainly don't mind um, but that's kind of to answer your question I don't do this for a living and I don't do this really for profit um, I get a lot of questions how much do you charge how much does it co did it cost that guy to have this done you know I, I don't really charge I mean I charge by the job um, sometimes I horse trade people you know if they have something that might interest me I might trade them for some working on one of their other pieces of equipment uh, sometimes I just uh, you know I will charge just a flat rate or something it just depends and again it's not about the money to me on this I never really could charge enough to make it worthwhile on these because you, you see how much time however much time you see on this uh, camera <laughs> just add about 10 times to that for the actual amount of hours that goes into it and I'm not exaggerating I mean you know for a for a four-hour video series it's not uncommon to have 40 hours of actual work in it um, you know very monotonous things like this and I and I don't really mind doing this you know I enjoy it uh, partially why I do it is because it's relaxing I really not a whole lot on TV and so forth that interests me anymore that I really want to watch. Um, this to me is more entertaining, just personally. So uh, it's it's not a bad thing for me. So um, yeah. So that's what I'm doing, and it, I'll clean this off a little bit, like you know, and then when I get it cleaned down to where I'm ready to start taking it apart, I got most of the dust out of the way, so it doesn't get all over everything. Then I'll come back and we'll. I'll show you how I take this apart. Another quick thing uh, to note is that now on this board we don't have to worry about it. But when you get into like the FM front end board or the AM front end, especially FM, you'll see those little coils and a lot of them are covered with wax or glue or something. Um, some of them are not covered with anything. You really want to be careful <laughs> with anything other than the very softest brush or anything when when cleaning around those because there are certain components on tuners that you cannot move them if you move them you will actually change the tuning of that circuit those coils are specifically bent to different uh, sizes or shapes or different distances between the coils and that's how you tune that circuit um, it's very critical and if you're in there and you get too aggressive cleaning things and you move those coils around or whatever or you change the wired routing or routing or something you can throw the uh, circuit out of tune so it's just something to keep in mind when you're cleaning these you gotta kinda use common sense uh, this method has worked for me because I kinda know the pitfalls and I've just done this for so many years I've never really had any problems but again if I don't put that out there <laughs> I you know I don't want to mislead anybody into uh, you know into getting into more work than you need to have so all right let's continue okay so we're now pretty much ready to get this thing out of here and uh, <laughs> this big bundle of wires here that's kind of another reason I want to get all as much grunge out here as I could because I kind of wanted to see what we're work dealing with here uh, the exploded view in this service manual for this isn't really very clear as to how this board comes out because obviously it's really tight in here there's a whole, all of these are wire wrapped there's really no plugs or connectors to disconnect this board um, but most of it looks like it's coming from this side here so this whole thing may possibly be able to swing out a little bit I don't know um, but we're gonna try 
So let's see here. So we got these screws out. And we got these two top brackets out. And it feels like everything's loose, but it's all still attached by all these cables. And looks like we're going to have to take out a whole bunch of cable ties. Maybe, well, maybe not a whole bunch, maybe just a few. And take out this grounding strap. And we'll see what happens. So let me clip those off and we'll be right back. Okay, so the easiest way to get at this turned out to be to take the faceplate back off again. You could see, just pull the knobs and take those four screws off. And then remove these three front screws that go into here. Then take these two bottom screws here, one here and one down here. And then take this swivel plate screw out here for the back and then take three screws out of the back here and then this whole metal plate this whole side just comes off or at least that appears like what's happening it's kind of tight and I'm trying to take my time because I do not want to uh, ruin any of these wires but essentially and then I just move this thing socket out of the way and you can see right here it is now once you get this far enough out here then we have to take off this little board here and it's just got a couple of screws holding it it's hard to get to those screws um, without the board swung back I know I'm hitting the camera. <laughs> so here we go. There we go. And again, you can just see how grungy this is in here. We're going to have to clean that all off. But that's part of it. So we'll go ahead and do that. And uh, now we can swing this board down and kind of take the back cover off and get into it to work on it and then we don't have to really disconnect very many of these wires so I'm going to do that and then we'll be back okay so here's another tip I use um, whenever working around the dial cord which is running right under here I usually will take a piece of aluminum foil and just kind of drape it over where the dial cord is that way you're in here and you're not paying attention you don't want to come up and hit that dial cord and <laughs> melt it in half because I'll tell you what nothing melts faster than dial cord it'll just pop right in half on you as soon as you touch it so um, this just gives you a little bit of added assurance that if you accidentally slip and of course I'm nowhere near it down here but what if I'm moving up this way and I hit it so I always do this um, doesn't cost anything just go up in your kitchen and get some aluminum foil good to go um, so starting to do the recap here and uh, pretty simple process I get a lot of questions about that and I've shown this in multiple videos I'm sure um, but essentially all you do is you get your gun on there like that and that's it now, here's the thing, um, you can use a desoldering pump, uh, well, kind of like one of these, um, you know, and like that. You can also use desoldering braid, like solder wick, and I think I have a little piece of it laying here. Looks kind of like this stuff. The only thing is, with those tools, you tend to dwell on the solder joint a lot longer. And because of that, you can cause these tracks to lift off more easily. So you have to be pretty quick with those. Um, you know, if you do have a desoldering gun like that, really that's the best way to go on these boards. Some of the older ones are even worse. These ones are pretty robust. 
you have to really abuse them with the soldering iron before the tracks will lift off but on some of the other ones out there you barely just heat them up too much and it the foil will just pop right up off the board so um just be careful that's all there is to it and then i pull the cap out put the new one in and resolder it and good to go so uh, i just thought i'd share those couple of tips okay while i'm doing this let's talk about capacitors a little bit um, <laughs> probably the most questions and comments i ever get are about capacitors and i really don't know if there's enough memory on a memory card to make a video that would encompass all the questions and things that you could that I would have to answer about a capacitor. Um, now, what I'm talking about right now is what we'll talk about is the electrolytics. So, right here in my shaky camera is an electrolytic capacitor that we're replacing. And this is an original one. And if you look at it, it's rated at 100 microfarads at 16 volts. And if you look at the new one for comparison sakes, this is also rated at 100 microfarads at 16 volts. And you can see how much smaller it is. Now, one of the things you can do, you can look at, hold on a second, is if I take... Here's 100 microfarads at 63 volts of a modern capacitor. And you can see it's the same size and shape as the 16 volt one was a long time ago. So you might be inclined to say, well, let's just throw this 63 volt one in there. <laughs> and what I will say is in a lot of cases, you can go higher on voltage. You, can't, you don't want to change the capacitance, okay? the value of the capacitor you want to keep the same but the voltage um, you can go higher but not lower now I will have a few comments to say about that first of all if you start looking at the data sheets on electrolytic capacitors uh, they talk about how a capacitor how its life span works in other words if a capacitor has been sitting for a very long time, like that's now we're talking electrolytics, we're not talking about film capacitors. Um, an electrolytic capacitor can actually unform itself, meaning that it no longer has the specifications that are written on it. So it may not be able to charge up to its full rated voltage, or it may not have the full rated capacitance. And it can even act somewhat like a resistor instead of a capacitor. All these things can happen with age because of the chemicals that are used uh, to make this be a capacitor. Now, when you apply a charge to the capacitor, if it's still a good cap, it will reform the capacitor eventually. In other words, the electrons that you impose upon the capacitor will electrochemically react with the electrolyte in here and the cap will return to its original value in time. Um, now here's the thing the way these reform like that they do need a certain rating of volt a certain percentage of their rated voltage applied to them so what I'm driving at is I have a 16 volt capacitor here I replace it with a 63 volt capacitor of the same capacitance. If that capacitor unforms, um, it's more difficult to reform the capacitor if you can't apply close 80% of the rated voltage to it or so. And if you read spec sheets on these caps, you'll see what I'm talking about. Does that mean you can never do that? Well, no. Um, if the device is being used regularly, and if the capacitor is being used for strictly um, like filtering a power supply, like you're filtering Ripple um, or 
just for holding a charge, then no, it really doesn't hurt to have a higher voltage cap. So if I took this 16 volt and I replaced it with a 35 volt cap or a 50 volt cap, it would work just fine. Where you run into problems is when you have an electrolytic capacitor like this in the audio path. In, and there are instances where that where high value capacitors are used and they use electrolytics because it's very expensive to use non-electrolytic high value caps. Also the non-electrolytic high value caps tend to be much physically larger and don't fit on the board. Now in those instances I would argue that I would not change the voltage a whole lot. In other words, I might, in place of this 16 volt, I might go to a 25 volt cap, but I probably wouldn't go to a 50 or a 63 volt because if you read the specifications of these caps, I can buy five of these capacitors, all Nichicon KT series, all the same series, all the same cap except different voltage, same capacitance even, 100 microfarad, and I could buy a 16 volt, 25, 35, 50, and 63 volt. And what you'll see when you look up the specifications is as you vary the frequency on these caps, their ESR will change, and they change at different rates based on the voltage rating of the capacitor. So actually, the different voltage capacitors will react differently to different frequencies and that is taken into account when these amps are designed so what's that going to do well theoretically if this is using used in the audio path you can have anywhere from 20 hertz up to 20 kilohertz going through this capacitor when it's in the audio path and as you vary the frequency the capacitive reactance of this capacitor will change. Um, remember, most capacitors are rated for either 50 or 120 hertz, which is a full wave rectified AC mains frequency. But when you start getting into audio frequency, you can be much higher than that, clear up in the 20 or 30 kilohertz range. So as a result, changing the, the voltage value of the capacitor too much may possibly affect the audio performance of that audio path. Now that's nitpicking. I'll be the first to admit that. Um, but there is some truth to it. And will everybody in every instance hear a difference? No, absolutely you won't. In very high-end audio gear, uh, paired up with very good speakers, paired up with a person who is very discerning in listening to sound and audio, yeah, they'll probably hear it. Um, I won't. <laughs> my ears are not that good. I had a hearing test last year and my actual hearing starts dropping off at about 8 kilohertz. Now, I'm not deaf by any means, but there is quite a bit of attenuation and it has gotten worse over the years. So, at about 12 kilohertz to 14 kilohertz, I'm no longer hearing anything. Um, so I used to be able to hear up to 22 kilohertz when I was a lot younger in my 20s. Um, those days are long gone. So again, and I'm not trying to start controversy on electrolytic capacitors, nor am I trying to scare everybody into buying a million different voltage values of caps. But I just want to make you aware of that and that, you know, um, my opinion varies with what caps, to how, how much of a perfect match a cap has to be based upon the application of it. Um, the other thing is what types of caps do I use? Well, this is a go-to one for me, the Nichicon KT series. They're very inexpensive. They're 105 degree rated capacitors. I'm not really worried so much about the temperature, but the 105s actually have a longer lifespan than the 85 degree in most instances but not all. The other ones that I use are the Nichicon FG series or fine gold which are these gold ones here. They're 85 degree caps but they're actually a little bit better for audio a little hot, more premium. Again some people call this snake oil but they do have a little bit of the, supposedly they have mechanical damping uh, to make them less uh, 
susceptible to physical shock with changing their value. And yes, there is something to that. <laughs> um, why do I use Nichicon? Well, simply because I'm familiar with the brands. Uh, the PW and the FW series, there's lots of different versions that are very good. Panasonic makes fantastic capacitors. They're very good. Um, you know, Cornell Dublier, very good capacitors. Mallory is good capacitors. Um, you know, all kinds. Sprague's, of course, very good. There's lots of good ones. Kemet is another good one. Um, as long as the specs are there, that's what it's all about. Beware of the ones you buy online from China um, that are mass produced. A lot of them will be rated at 105 degree and everything. And uh, a lot of them are not very good quality and they don't hold up. I speak from experience because even some of the uh, medical equipment that I work on, we've had some uh, that were released with the cheaper capacitors. And we had some pretty catastrophic failures with those caps. Um, a lot of the televisions out there, flat screen TVs uh, with switch mode power supplies, they were using the cheaper capacitors that weren't rated for, for high ripple current and so forth, not rated for switch mode power supplies. And two years after you bought the television, the TV would quit working and it was always the capacitors. So again, make sure you purchase the right ones. Um, so I'm not telling you you have to get, you know, KT or FG series niche cons, but I, I will tell you I've used them a lot and the, for the price, especially with these KTs, I've had very good results and they, they last very well. So there you go. So I'm going to finish doing this. Uh, that's my little, <laughs> little thing on a uh, little talk on caps but I know I get a lot of questions about them and keep them coming and I'll try to answer them okay every once in a while you will run into a electrolytic capacitor that looks like this and if you notice it's a very low rating or a value it's only rated at about where are we at I can't see through the camera 0 0.22 microfarad at 50 volts so this is called a non-polarized or bipolar electrolytic capacitor. Usually they're used in the audio path and they're, they can definitely go bad and, and often do. I always replace them with these. Now these do not have a plus and minus. So if you put a polarized capacitor in there, you're going to have some problems. I replace them with little film capacitors like this and you can get these they're relatively inexpensive they work really well and they are a nice drop-in replacement for these old electrolytics and these ones really really last a long time they probably will never wear out in your lifetime <laughs> so just another little tip Okay, we're all recapped and put back together and ready to give her another test. Okay, so now that we have the uh, tuner all back together and recapped and everything, um, I'm getting the impression that it probably isn't going to need much in the line of alignment. Maybe a little touch up or something, but I'm just not, I don't think. But what I'd rather do on this video is kind of show you a couple of neat things that I have here. Um, I have a setup that I'm just trying out for the first time really to see what we get and um, I have to admit I'm pretty happy with the results so I think I'm going to show it to all of you. So let's take you through the whole scenario. So the first thing I have is I have my HP 8657A and it's set up for a 98 megahertz carrier signal which is right at the center of our tuning band for FM. I have 10 microvolts uh, set for the output and it is going into my little T network and I did a video on that earlier um, if you look at the how to you know connecting a 50, <laughs> 50 ohm signal generator to a non 50 ohm load so you can go back and check that video. I have a 400 hertz signal 
set it at 75% um, or 75 kilohertz modulation there. It's FM modulated. And I also have the SG-165 set up, but I'm not using it yet for when we get to the stereo test. We're going to do our mono test first. Now, here's how we're monitoring all of this. First of all, I'm coming out of the record out jacks left and right straight into my oscilloscope so we can actually see our 400 hertz tone after it's been demodulated by the tuner and then run through all of the different parts of the tuner. So that's what that looks like. And then I'm using a very unique piece of software. It's by a company called Comtek. C-O-M-T-E-K-K. -K. And I have to admit, I, you know, I'm not being endorsed by this company or anything. I kind of happened upon this little piece of software that you can download. And I got to say, I really like it. Comparing this to uh, my leader LDM-171 distortion meter and also to my Keithley 2015 THD multimeter, this thing tracks almost perfectly with it for an inexpensive piece of software. Um, don't ask me the cost, I don't remember, I just know it wasn't very expensive. And what I will do is I will hit the uh, about and I'll zoom you in on it and you can go to this website yourself and check them out uh, if you like this product after you see it but there it is you can pause the camera and write that all down if you want um, but what this is is this is software that allows you to use your sound card in your computer um, to measure total harmonic distortion signal to, do signal -to noise ratio and Synad, all in one neat software. Now, it's a little bit tricky to get set up at first, um, but essentially what I'm using is I'm using my bench computer here, which is actually a pretty decent computer, but what I've done is I, I got an external sound blaster. Um, there it is, if you can see it. <laughs> it's a sound blaster USB sound card. I don't know if I can zoom in and on it any more or not, but it doesn't matter. The idea is get a good quality, high quality sound card, not a cheapy one. And uh, you use the microphone input on that. And you can also order from Comtech. They have a line isolation unit. It's a little circuit board you can buy from them. It allows you to put a stereo signal into your sound card and use it with the software. It'll mix it together. It also puts a 600 ohm load impedance and it has built-in overload protection so it protects the input of your sound card. Now I'm coming out of the record jacks and into that as well. So you can see my little splitter down here if you can follow what I'm doing. Some of you may not understand what I'm doing here. Some of you might. So um, <laughs> some of you might get some help out of this. Some may not. But here, here's the thing I really like about this is I have the signal in there and you can hear. Have it hooked up to some speakers so you can hear it. And basically all, we do, all we're doing is we're putting a 10 microvolt signal into the tuner. I'm tuning it to that 98 megahertz which you can see the dials dead on and then I'm reading out the total harmonic distortion of the signal and you can see that it's floating if I zoom in here a little bit it's floating right around 0.2 to 0.3 percent total harmonic distortion after going through all this mess <laughs> That's pretty good actually with a 10 microvolt signal. If I go down to 2.5 microvolts, um, which is pretty much about as low as you're going to get on a FM broadcast tuner, and actually this thing will actually make an audible tone at 0.5 microvolts. I was able to still hear the sound. You can hear the static as you would expect, and it's really still only about 
1% distortion roughly. Now the really cool thing about this software is I can click this mode button and this is THD plus distortion and you can see the green and the red it's saying good <laughs> and out of tolerance and you can see even at 2.5 microvolts it's still listenable and there's your Synad and Synad the, the higher the DB rating the better your Synad so right now even with that really very very low input signal we're still getting a Synad of about 17 and you can hear there is some noise in the background and you can see the noise on the scope now some other things that I love about this software is whenever you're using a piece of test equipment like the Keithley 2015 or like this leader up here you can see right there or the Keithley you have to set it very precisely to the to the frequency either they they both have signal generator outputs so I can set this to output a frequency then you have to go through all these menus to set it so forth this thing doesn't really care what frequency because here's what happens no matter what modulation frequency you pick you can just move this up and down see the little line moving back and forth and I can go up that's that's the center frequency that you're measuring your distortion or your synad on so if if I move this line till it's right over top of the peak like that it gives you an accurate measurement the same thing go, and you can change the scale of your spectrum analyzer down here you see I can make it bigger wider or, or narrower same thing on this side I can go lower or higher see there very very cool and then you can move your scales up and down just like that so really a neat feature and anywhere you go it'll measure so essentially this little piece of software lets you very easily measure Synad signal to noise signal to noise plus distortion plus total harmonic distortion so let's go back to distortion and again we're gonna go up to about 10 microvolts and you can see we're getting a really nice low freak or uh, low THD and remember it's probably a little better than this because we're going through all this test equipment everything's sitting open on the bench and everything I have the antenna signal uh, kinda draped across the, <laughs> the bench and so forth so it can definitely pick up some noise off of some of the stuff on the bench so really it's probably even better than that but here's the cool thing so I'm gonna switch over now to the SG165 and we're going to look at a stereo signal and we're going to look at how the, the uh, how the distortion changes okay so hold on one second let's switch it over okay so I now have it switched over to stick to the uh, SG165 multiplex signal and the first thing you notice is the signal has really really attenuated itself and that's normal remember when you're listening to a stereo multiplex signal the your signal is going to be way attenuated from a mono signal that's normal it's the nature of how stereo multiplex works okay so if I look over here remember what your amplitude was earlier so let's go back to regular FM so that's the mono FM and they're stereo you see the difference so it's attenuated a little bit so as you can imagine with a lower attenuation you're gonna get a lower output signal and you can see on the spectrum it's lower but more importantly 
the tone generator in my SG-165 is not exactly 400 hertz. Um, it's actually a little bit below that. And it's just the nature of how the SG-165 works. You, you can't really adjust that tone. <laughs> you could adjust it a little bit, but it's hard to get it perfect on there the way the thing's designed. But with this software, I can just dial down till I'm right on it. And there, now I'm measuring it right on peak again. And you can see that with the same 10 microvolts, which is still, which is actually a pretty low signal for a stereo signal, I'm still getting less than 1% total harmonic distortion, even with all the noisy wires and stuff hooked up. Pretty neat, huh? And we are now getting a nice stereo signal. And you can hear how the signal is actually a little bit lower pitched and part of the reason that we have a little bit higher distortion now even with the higher signal drive is you're now looking at the limitation of the SG-165. Um, one of the problems with the SG-165 and with the Sound Technologies 1000A they're both older pieces of test equipment and the signals that they output are not ultra low distortion so you have to understand these tuners can actually outperform my test equipment in this instance so if you really want to get a super accurate reading of your signal to noise ratio and your THD and so forth you really need to have <laughs> a better signal generator than that now my HP 8657 can definitely do it but because it's a very pure output but these less expensive pieces of all-in-one test equipment like the SG-165 and like the sound I, not, I even did the low the low distortion modification on my um, sound technologies 1000 and even with that it still cannot perform to the level of these tuners so why am I going through all this and wasting all this time on this video? Well, I just kind of want to, number one, show you, I get so many questions about the SG-165 itself and the sound technologies and what kind of test equipment should I buy. <laughs> um, understand when you buy these things, they're limited. Um, the SG-165 does not have the very lowest distortion out there of test, other test equipment. Number two, it doesn't have a very accurate frequency. As you can see, I had to adjust my software because the modulation tone that's supposed to be 400 hertz is only 380 hertz on my SG-165. Um, there are many limitations. So remember, when you buy a piece of test equipment like that, know what it is that you're getting. Um, now, if you wanted to spend a couple thousand dollars for a used piece of uh, really good like Panasonic or Kenwood or one of those uh, stereo signal generators, you'll get better results. But just understand, again, when you're doing an alignment, don't get caught up between <laughs> what the, what's a problem in your tuner that you're aligning and what's a problem with your test equipment that you're using to align it with. That's kind of what I wanted to show you. And I also wanted to show you this software, which is just pretty awesome. I, I got to admit, it's pretty amazing. So you can see, again, this, this tuner is really performing well because even down to 10 microvolts on a stereo signal, I don't have enough pilot tone now to get my stereo indicator, so it's kind of in mono now. But if you notice, I'm still getting pretty 1% distortion or less. And you can hear it. Pretty good. So uh, there's just a little example of a test setup for uh, checking your, si your uh, distortion and checking your tuner. Uh, going through all these motions is a good way to test the tuner for alignment to see if you really need to align it or not. This is how I do it.
okay just kind of showing you um, I usually use my Keithley but I thought I'd start using this uh, piece of test equipment here this Comtex Synad 1.2 and I have to admit I'm really impressed with it I like it it's it wasn't very expensive and I think that little module that I got and I'll show it to you once again you can buy it from their website they ship it to you uh, if I don't knock everything over getting it here you can see it's the CT uh, come on these cameras suck up close for focusing CT ISO max I don't know if it'll focus on it there it goes I think so you can order that and I think that thing was 20 or 30 dollars something like that and they ship it to you so there you go um, that is pretty much how that works now what I'll do is I'll do this same test um, not only at 98 megahertz but I'll go down to 88 megahertz or 88.5 and then I'll go up to around 108 and I'll check to just see how it tracks now understand <laughs> test equipment comes into play again even with that T, T network matching there's going to be an attenuation that's going to be more on one end of the spectrum than on the other so for instance let's move down we're going to keep everything the same here except we're going to change our frequency to 88.5 megahertz all right and we're going to go down here and we're going to tune it to 88.5 you can hear I'm on there roughly and you can see pretty close right there now remember I'm driving this with about 10 microvolts in stereo and now if we go up to 108 okay and we're gonna go up to 108 let's see if I can get everything in shot here okay and it's pretty close still and you can see there's a little bit I don't know if this if the camera will pick it up but there's a little bit of noise on there a little more so than there was at 88.5 and again that's that's because of that T network but it's pretty close you can see it's staying pretty flat So all around, we're staying around that 1% distortion. And again, it's probably the tuner is doing better than that. But this is the limitation of our test equipment. Okay. So all of this is pretty cool. Um, this is, I like this kind of stuff. Um, not sure how interested all of you are in this, but for those of you who are into this, there you go. So this video is getting pretty long I was gonna go into the alignment of the oscilloscope but I think we're gonna save that for the next part because um, I spent a lot of time talking about some different things and answering some questions on this video and uh, in the next video we'll start uh, looking at the uh, oscilloscope and then we'll start looking at the amplifier just what this thing can do when we open it up all right again thank you all for coming along for the ride here i wish you all peace joy happiness and good health in your lives and as always stay well and we'll see you soon bye bye